Chapter 11 of the Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War, 1861-1865. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War, 1861-1865, by Leander Stilwell. Chapter 11, Helena, Arkansas, Life in a Hospital, August, 1863. General Sherman soon drove General Johnston out of Jackson and beyond Pearl River, and then his column returned to the vicinity of Vicksburg. On July 22nd, our division marched back to Snyder's Bluff and resumed our old camp. But we had not been here long before it was rumored that we were under marching orders and would soon leave for some point in Arkansas. Sure enough, on July 29th, we marched to the Yazoo River and filed on board the side-wheel steamer Sultana, steamed down the river to its mouth, and there turned up the Mississippi, headed north. I will remark here that one of the most tragical and distressing incidents of the war was directly connected with a frightful disaster that later befell the above-named steamboat. It left Vicksburg for the north on or about April 25, 1865, having on board nearly 1,900 Union soldiers, all of whom, with few exceptions, were paroled prisoners. On the morning of April 27th, while near Memphis, the boilers of the boat exploded, and it was burnt to the water's edge. Over eleven hundred of these unfortunate men perished in the wreck, in different ways, some scalded to death by escaping steam, some by fire, others, and the greatest number, by drowning. Besides the soldiers, cabin passengers, and members of the boat's crew, to the number of about a hundred and forty, also perished. It was the greatest disaster of that kind that ever occurred on the Mississippi. It may perhaps be noticed that the regiment is leaving the vicinity of Vicksburg without my saying a word about the appearance at that time of that celebrated stronghold. There is good reason for it. Namely, it so happened that we never were in the place. We were close to it on the north and on the east, but that was all and I never yet have seen Vicksburg, and it is not probable now that I ever shall. We arrived at Helena, Arkansas, on July 31st, debarked, and went into camp near the bank of the river, about two miles below the town. There were no trees in our camp except a few cottonwoods. The ground on which we walked, sat, and slept was, in the main, just a mass of hot sand, and we got water for drinking and cooking purposes from the Mississippi River. The country back of the town, and in that immediate vicinity generally, was wild and thinly settled, and had already been well foraged, so we were restricted to the ordinary army diet, of which one of the principal items, as usual, was fat sow belly. I never understood why we were not allowed to camp in the woods west of the town, there was plenty of high, well-shaded space there, and we soon could have sunk wells that would have furnished cool, palatable water. But this was not done, and the regiment remained for about two weeks camped on the river bank in the conditions above described. A natural result was that numbers of the men were prostrated by malarial fever, and this time I happened to be one of them. I now approach a painful period of my army career. I just lay there, in a hot tent, on the sand, oh, so sick, but I fought off going to the hospital as long as possible. I had a superstitious dread of an army hospital. I had seen so many of the boys loaded into ambulances and hauled off to such a place who never returned, that I was determined never to go to one if it could be avoided in any honorable way. But the time came when it was a military necessity that I should go, and there was no alternative. The campaign that was in contemplation was a movement westward 
against the confederates under general sterling price at little rock with the intention of capturing that place and driving the confederates from the state the officer in command of the union forces was general frederick Steele. marching orders were issued fixing the thirteenth of august as the day our regiment would start all the sick who were unable to march and i was among that number were to be sent to the division hospital so on the morning before the regiment moved an ambulance drove up to my tent and some of the boys carried me out and put me in the vehicle captain keeley was standing by he pressed my hand and said good-bye stillwell brace up you'll be all right soon i was feeling too wretched to talk much i only said good-bye captain and let it go at that later when i rejoined the regiment keeley told me that when he bade me good-bye that morning he never expected to see me again. Our division hospital, to which I was taken, consisted of a little village of wall tents in the outskirts of Helena. The tents were arranged in rows, with perhaps from fifteen to twenty in a row, with their ends pinned back against the sides, thus making an open space down an entire row. The sick men lay on cots, of which there was a line on each side of the interior of the tents, with a narrow aisle between. I remained at the hospital eight days, and was very sick the most of the time, and retained a distinct recollection of only a few things. But, aside from men dying all around me, both day and night, nothing important happened. All the accounts that I have read of this movement of General Steele's on Little Rock agree in stating that the number of men he left sick at helena and other places between there and little rock was extraordinary and beyond all usual proportions and from what i saw myself i think these statements must be true and a necessary consequence of this heavy sick list was the fact that it must have been impossible to give the invalids the care and attention they should have received we had but few attendants, and they were soldiers detailed for that purpose who were too feeble to march, but were supposed to be capable of rendering hospital service, and the medical force left with us was so scanty that it was totally inadequate for the duties they were called on to perform. Oh, those nights were so long! At intervals in the aisle a bayonet would be stuck in the ground with a lighted candle in its socket and when a light went out, say after midnight, it stayed out, and we would toss around on those hard cots in a state of semi-darkness until daylight. If any attendants moved around among us in the latter hours of the night, I never saw them. We had well water to drink, which, of course, was better than that from the river, but it would soon become insipid and warm, and sometimes, especially during the night, we didn't have enough of that. On one occasion, about midnight, soon after I was taken to the hospital, I was burning with fever and became intolerably thirsty for a drink of water. No attendants were in sight, and the candles had all gone out but one or two, which emitted only a sort of flickering light that barely served to render darkness visible. My suffering became well-nigh unendurable, and I could stand it no longer. I got up and staggered to the door of the tent, and looking about me saw not far away a light gleaming through a tent that stood apart from the others i made my way to it as best i could and went in a young fellow maybe an assistant surgeon was seated at the further end of a little desk writing my entrance was so quiet that he did not hear me and walking up to him i said in a sort of hollow voice i want a drink of water the fellow dropped his pen and nearly fell off his stool. The only garment I had on was a white, sleazy sort of cotton bedgown, which they garbed us all in when we were taken to the hospital. And this chap's eyes, as he stared at me, looked as if they would pop out of his head. Perhaps he thought I was a gliding ghost. But he got me some water, and I drank copiously. I don't clearly remember what followed. It seems to me that this man helped me back to my tent but I am not sure. However, I was in the same old cot next morning. The fare at the hospital was not of a nature liable to generate an attack of the gout, 
but I reckon those in charge did the best they could. The main thing seemed to be a kind of thin soup with some grains of rice or barley in it. What the basis of it was, I don't know. I munched a hard tack occasionally, which was far better than the soup, but my appetite was quite scanty anyhow. One day we each had at dinner, served in our tin plates, about two or three tablespoons of preserved currants, for which it was said we were indebted to the U.S. Sanitary Commission. It seemed that a boatload of such goods came down the river in charge of a committee of ladies destined for our hospitals at Vicksburg. The boat happened to make a temporary stop at Helena, and the ladies ascertained that there was at the hospitals there great need of sanitary supplies, so they donated us the bulk of their cargo. I will remark here that that little dab of currants was all the U.S. sanitary stuff I consumed during my Army service. I'm not kicking, merely stating the fact. Those goods very properly went to the hospitals, and as my stay therein was brief, my share of the delicacies was consequently correspondingly slight. As regards the medicine given us in the hospital at Helena, my recollection is that it was almost entirely quinine, and the doses were frequent and copious, which I suppose was all right. There was a boy in my company of about my age, a tall, lanky chap named John Barton. He had lived in our neighborhood at home, and we were well acquainted prior to our enlistment. He was a kind-hearted, good sort of a fellow, but he had, while in the army, one unfortunate weakness, the same being a voracious appetite for intoxicating liquor, and he had a remarkable faculty for getting the stuff under any and all circumstances. He could nose it out in some way as surely and readily as a bear could find a bee tree. But to keep the record straight, I will further say that after his discharge he turned over a new leaf, quit the use of whiskey, and lived a strictly temperate life. He was under the weather when the regiment left Helena, and so was detailed to serve as a nurse at the hospital, and was thus engaged in my tent. Since making that bad break at Owl Creek, I had avoided whiskey as if it were a rattlesnake, but somehow, while here in the hospital, I began to feel an intense craving for some spiritus frumenti, as the surgeons called it. So one day I asked John Barton if he couldn't get me a canteen full of whiskey. He said he didn't know, was afraid it would be a difficult job, but to give him my canteen and he would try. That night, as late maybe as one or two o'clock, and when the lights were nearly all out as usual, I heard someone stealthily walking up the aisle and stopping occasionally at different cots, and presently I heard a hoarse whisper, Stillwell, Stillwell. Here, I answered in the same tone. The speaker then came to me. It was old John, and stooped down, he whispered, By God, I've got it. "'Bully for you, John,' said I. He raised me to a sitting posture, removed the cork, and put the mouth of the canteen to my lips, and I drank about as long as I could hold my breath. John took a moderate swig himself, then carefully put the canteen in my knapsack, which was serving as my pillow, cautioned me to keep it concealed to avoid its being stolen, and went away. I was asleep in about five minutes after my head struck my knapsack, and slept all the balance of the night just like a baby. On waking up I felt better too, and wanted something to eat. However, let no one think who may read these lines that I favor the use of whiskey as a medicine, for I don't. But the situation in those Helena hospitals was unusual and abnormal. The water was bad. Our food was no good and very unsatisfactory, and conditions generally were simply wretched. I am not blaming the military authorities. They doubtless did the best they could. It seemed to me that I was getting weaker every day. It looked as if something had to be done, and acting on the maxim that desperate cases require desperate remedies, I resorted for the time being to the whiskey treatment. I made one unsuccessful attempt afterwards to get some to serve as a tonic, which perhaps may be mentioned later, and then forever abandoned the use of the stuff for any purpose. 
Immediately succeeding the above-mentioned incident, the fever let up on me, and I began to get better, though still very weak. My great concern right now was to rejoin the regiment just as soon as possible. It was taking part in an active campaign, in which fighting was expected, and the idea was intolerable that the other boys should be at the front, marching and fighting, while I was in the rear playing the part of a hospital pimp. It was reported that a steamboat was going to leave soon, via the Mississippi and White Rivers, with convalescence for Steele's army, and I made up my mind to go on that boat at all hazards. But to accomplish that it was necessary, as I was informed, to get a written permit from the division surgeon, Major Shubal York, of the 54th Illinois Infantry. So one morning, bright and early, I blacked my shoes and brushed up my old cap and clothing generally, and started to Major York's headquarters to get the desired permission. He was occupying a large two-story house with shade trees in the yard in the residence part of town, and his office was in the parlor in the first story of the building. I walked in and found an officer of the rank of Major seated at a table, engaged in writing. I removed my cap and, standing at attention, saluted him and asked if this was Major York, and was answered in the affirmative. I had my little speech carefully prepared, and proceeded at once to deliver it as follows. My name is Leander Stillwell. I am a sergeant of Company D of the 61st Illinois Infantry, which is now with General Steele's Army. The regiment marched about a week ago, and as I was then sick with a fever, I could not go, but was sent to the division hospital here in Helena. I am now well, and have come to you to request a permit to enable me to rejoin my regiment. The Major looked at me closely while I was speaking, and after I had concluded, he remained silent for a few seconds, still scrutinizing me intently. Then he said in a low and very kind tone, "'Why, Sergeant, you are not able for duty, and won't be for some time. Stay here till you get a little stronger.' His statement was a bitter disappointment to me. I stood there in silence a little while, twisting and turning with trembling hands my old, faded, and battered cap. I finally managed to say, I want to go to my regiment. And here my lips began to tremble, and I got no further. Now don't laugh at this. It was simply the case of a boy, weak and broken down by illness, who was homesick to be with his comrades. The Major did not immediately respond to my last remark, but continued to look at me intently. Presently he picked up his pen and said, I am inclined to think that the best medical treatment for you is to let you go to your regiment, and he thereupon wrote and handed me the permit, which was quite brief, consisting only of a few lines. I thanked him and departed with a light heart. I will digress here for a moment to chronicle with deep sorrow the sad fate that ultimately befell the kind and noble surgeon Major York. While he, with his regiment, was home on veteran furlough in March 1864, an organized gang of copperheads made a dastardly attack on some of the soldiers of the regiment at Charleston, Illinois, and murdered Major York and five privates and also severely wounded the Colonel Greenville M. Mitchell and three privates, see official records, War of the Rebellion, serial number 57, page 629. The war ended over half a century ago, and the feelings and passions engendered thereby as between the people of the nation and those of the late Confederate states have well nigh wholly subsided, which is right, but nevertheless I will set it down here that in my opinion the most undesirable citizens that ever have afflicted our country were the traitorous malignant breed that infested some portions of the loyal states during the war and were known as copperheads. The rattlesnake gives warning before it strikes, but the copperhead snake of equally deadly venom gives none and the two-legged copperheads invariably pursued the same course. They deserved the name. On leaving Major York's office, I returned to the hospital and gathered up my stuff, which included my gun, 
cartridge box, knapsack, haversack, and canteen, and said good-bye to Barton and the other boys I knew, then to the commissary tent, and exhibiting my permit, was furnished with five days' rations of hardtack, bacon, coffee, and sugar, thence to the river landing, and on to the steamboat Pike, which was to take the present batch of convalescents to Steele's army. End of chapter 11